Why you should play Heroine's Quest. If you like classic point-and-click adventure games like King's Quest, and more specifically the Sierra series Quest for Glory, which was originally titled Hero's Quest, but I'll be referring to it as Quest for Glory for the purposes of this video, you owe it to yourself to give this absolutely free game a try. That game? Heroine's Quest. There will be minor spoilers for this game in the video, but nothing too major. Heroine's Quest is a labor of love that was in development for over four years by a literal single-digit group of people and features over 100 hand-painted backgrounds, beautifully animated sprites, a cheeky sense of humor, a fully voice-acted cast, great soundtrack, and a class system reminiscent of the Quest for Glory series, which includes alternative approaches to certain situations based on your class or skills available to you. Before I get into Heroine's Quest proper, a little background is suggested. The original Quest for Glory, So You Want to Be a Hero, really hooked me when I first stumbled upon this game. I was at a friend's house just exploring his computer while he played Shadows of the Empire for Nintendo 64, and I came across Quest for Glory 1, So You Want to Be a Hero. And I started asking about it. He suggested I check it out, and I booted it up and was enamored instantly. I had played the King's Quest series before, but this felt like an entirely new world in comparison. As soon as you begin the game, you are given an option of three classes, a fighter, magic user, or thief. And upon choosing one of these classes, you are taken to a statistic and skill screen to assign beginning points wherever you choose. I knew immediately this was going to be an incredible experience. I went on to greatly enjoy not only the first game, but the other three sequels available to me at that time, and the series quickly became one of my favorites of all time to this very day. It was years later before it came out, but there was an eventual fifth title in the series that would be released in the late 90s as well. While the series was never intended by the designers to go beyond even four entries, with the third game, Wages of War, not being an original part of their design concept, fans like myself were still hungry for more of this type of game. Enter Adventure Game Studio, or AGS. This is a free software that aimed to provide an environment that would be conducive to developing point-and-click adventure games of that era. While the software was initially released in the late 1990s, it would be the 2000s when it would truly flourish. In the 2000s, many products were developed with AGS, including VGA remakes of the first two King's Quest games in 2001 and 2002 respectively, by an ambitious group of people under the banner of Tierra, which would later be rebranded as AGDI or Anonymous Game Developers Interactive. Around this time, they would also form a commercial studio by the name of Himalaya Studios, which would eventually produce titles for retail such as Alamo in 2005 and Mage's Initiation in 2019, both of which are classical point-and-click adventure titles. The AGDI Wing would later release a VGA remake of King's Quest III in 2011, bringing the entire series to at least a VGA standard. In 2008, AGDI gave Quest for Glory 2, Trial by Fire, the same treatment as the previously released King's Quest games. That is to say, they used AGS to create a VGA version of Quest for Glory 2, as an official one was never forthcoming from Sierra. This game received a large amount of praise, and to my mind, is definitively excellent work. I have a playthrough of the Thief class up on my channel if you'd like to take a look at that game. I'll provide a link in the description below if you find yourself interested. If you're a fan of these older titles, or the genre in general, I'd highly recommend looking into the King's Quest and Quest for Glory remake games. They're well worth it and are high quality productions. These are full-blown VGA remakes we're talking about, lovingly crafted and in some cases with expanded content, or cut content restored. The King's Quest remakes are completely voice acted, and very well at that. The wizard is writing at his desk. He looks up from his work and greets you with a scowl. Boy, you know I don't like you to enter my private study, especially when I'm writing. Leave now, or I'll make you leave. But that's a topic for another video. Let's get into the topic of Heroine's Quest. The release of AGS had heralded a golden age of point-and-click resurgence, and it was in this environment that Heroine's Quest became a concept one that would be first shelved until years later when it was revitalized, re-envisioned, and eventually released by a company going by the name of Crystal Shard. Heroine's Quest begins much in the same manner as Quest for Glory. The player names their character and proceeds to choose a class between the warrior, sorceress, or the rogue. A little more on this later. 
Players are then given a statistics screen at which point they are to distribute their starting point pool to either improve the default skills, which are based on your chosen class, or acquire skills that the class would otherwise not have. Statistics can also be improved here, but I prefer to learn skills I otherwise wouldn't have access to in order to play more of a hybrid class, though it makes starting out a little rougher or more difficult, particularly in this game. I especially enjoy to take magic on my thief for the added convenience at times. Though in my recent playthrough, I mainly stuck to roguish solutions, since they were more effective most of the time for my character. The game begins with a cutscene depicting our heroine walking through the snowy and mountainous terrain before being ambushed by a two-headed troll that causes an avalanche, catching the heroine off guard. Taking her items, he leaves her to die in the snow. Another scene plays illustrating that the heroine was targeted by a frost giant and that this was no act of random violence. A bit more foreshadowing occurs, and then we are greeted by a woman by the name of Hervor who has been watching over us as we recover by the warm fire. It turns out that this is the Adventurer's Guild of Forge Sigtuna, and while she is not the Guildmaster, she watches over the building. Her husband, Voland, found the heroine while out and about and brought her back to the Guild. That's the good news. Unfortunately, an unusually harsh winter seems to be occurring in the area, and Hervor isn't able to offer any food to the hero and suggests that she should be about finding some before she starves. But at the very least, the heroine is welcome to use this area as a place to sleep anytime she wishes. With that, you're off and playing the game, free to explore the town or areas surrounding it. The game features a Nordic-inspired plot, locale, and characters, integrating Norse mythology and design. In some ways, it is akin to the plot of the first Quest for Glory game, but only to some degree, as it is also completely different in others. The general gist follows typical point-and-click adventure design, acquire items, Use said items in various ways to progress the plot or to acquire other items. Where Heroine's Quest and Quest for Glory before it really shine, though, is the addition of RPG elements to the genre. This is what initially hooked me about the Quest for Glory series and is something that Heroine's Quest does very well. I'd go as far as to say that in some ways they are integrated better and more fluidly in this game than in the Quest for Glory titles themselves. Skills can be raised by the act of using them, so one raises climbing just in the act of or attempt to climb objects, such as the city walls when night falls or various trees and cliff sides. In my case, I'm a rogue, so I immediately started working on my stealth skill by switching to sneak mode. This will be helpful when trying to avoid combat in the woods or when sneaking into someone's house to relieve them of their valuables in order to fatten my purse when the time comes. An interesting addition that Heroine's Quest brings is the Fast Talk skill, which opens up more dialogue options or success of those options, depending on the level of the skill, and in this way is similar to something like Speech in the Fallout series. Being that I opted to take magic and whatnot when creating my character, I encountered a very strong foe in terms of the extreme cold to be found in this land immediately. That's because Heroine's Quest features an environmental system of sorts, in that you can literally freeze to death. Various factors come into play for this system, such as items that warm the character, the time of day, and so forth. If you aren't careful and expend too much of your stamina out in the wilds, you could quite literally die of frostbite. As I mentioned, this was my biggest challenge early in the game, but once I got the hang of it, I really enjoyed it as an additional factor to keep in mind and consider. The result of acquiring items to keep me warmer and raising my stats in general gave a real sense of progress as I could slowly withstand more and more punishment or time in the wilds as my character's stats increased and equipment was accrued. Another factor one needs to consider is hunger. Like the cool temperatures, if the heroine doesn't eat often enough, you begin to lose stamina at a certain point and will die of starvation in the end. Neither of these are immediate concerns that are going to kill you randomly, but they are something that absolutely needs consideration while playing and add an extra layer of depth to the gameplay and consideration of what actions are to be taken by the player. Food can be acquired in a variety of ways. Rations of sorts can be purchased from some vendors. Those skilled in herbalism can acquire natural foods in the wild. Those with the proper skill set are able to fish at a nearby lake. Food can be stolen from some NPCs, and wild game can be fought and killed for meat. This is literally the first challenge thrown at the player, as the heroine starts the game hungry and must secure nourishment or face death. And how you go about that will depend on what class and skills are available to the player based on their choices and character creation. Further, resting is not the same as getting a good night's sleep. The player has the option to rest for an hour at almost any given time, and while this can be a good way to pass time while waiting for a shop to open or night to fall, 
the heroine has to be careful about where she chooses us to rest. Resting outside passes time in the cold environment and can lead to becoming too cold, which can be cured by resting indoors or spending time in a warm environment. Consider too that hunger will also begin gnawing at you if you rest too often, but without enough adequate and real sleep, exhaustion will also play a factor in the end. These needs all must be met from time to time, and I love this extra layer of thought put into the game. Heroine's Quest, and the games that inspired it, also feature a combat system that further sets them apart from other titles in the genre. In the Quest for Glory series, the quality of the combat can vary pretty strongly from title to title, but I'm happy to say that the simple but elegant combat of Heroine's Quest was implemented very well. The heroine can dodge, stab, slash, throw objects, cast magical spells, or even learn specialty attacks to provide a reasonable variety of playstyles. The ability in combat is directly correlated with the player's stats and skill levels, providing another good sense of character progression as the game carries on. After your first day, the heroine will be asked to meet with the Jarl the next morning. After this meeting, the wizard Arvindale will provide the player with a magical map, one of the most useful items in the game. While exploring the forest of Yarvadir and beyond, the heroine can find various points of interest and will fill out the map as she goes, allowing for relatively easy navigation of the land without having to commit everything to memory or drawing your own map, as one may have had to do in the Quest for Glory games. This is a fantastic quality of life improvement and is very helpful, though some may be a bit put off by what is effectively a quest marker located on the map at any given time to point the player in the direction of the next point of interest or relevance to the story. The player isn't required to immediately investigate any given marker, however, and is generally free to go about and engage in side quests or other aspects of the game. I found it to be very convenient and not limiting in any regard. Whether by utilizing the hint on the map or making your way randomly through exploration, the player will eventually come to the first real plot point in the game. A character has been attacked by the same troll who caused the avalanche in the beginning of the game and is found lying in the wilderness, freezing to death. Our heroine helps him out and back to town one way or another, after lightening his coin purse, of course, if you're the rogue, and it's here we discover the second town in the game, Munarvagir. It's here that I'd like to take a minute to talk about the options for resolving problems the player encounters. Upon saving Sigurd, the heroine is told she is welcome to stay at the inn free of charge at any time. Under the right conditions during this event, the player can also be offered free meals for life, which can be very helpful. During the first night's stay at the Skyfire Inn, the heroine's sleep is disturbed by a shadowy figure making off with some of our belongings out the window. As a perceptive rogue, the player is able to follow this silhouette out the window into a nearby abandoned building, at which point a puzzle is presented to the player in order to proceed. A warrior, on the other hand, has to get to this point a little differently. Upon climbing out the window, after the thief, there is no silhouette, but there is a small fragment of cloth upon the ground that can be picked up and examined. Left with little else to go on, the warrior can return to their bed and begin to ask questions in the morning. If you offer the cloth to Sigurd, he says something along the lines of, what do I look like, a dog? At which point the player can take the hint to offer the cloth to a dog running about town. This dog will take the scent and eventually lead the player to the same abandoned building, but through another means than the rogue. The warrior also has another means of solving the puzzle within the building, and it's this sort of divergent gameplay mechanic that has always enticed me to the Quest for Glory series, and which is strongly present and well executed in Heroine's Quest. While some side quests will only appear based on the character class, there are many other interactions in the game that have more than one solution depending on what tools the player has available or how they go about things. A chasm may be crossed by using acrobatics as a rogue, casting a teleport spell as a sorceress, or climbing along the stalactites if the player has enough strength. The options in this example aren't inherently restricted by class though. A sorceress with the proper skills isn't required to cross the chasm with the teleport spell, but can take those other routes if their skills make it possible. This is true for many of the problems the heroine will encounter throughout the game, and this is the real charm of this game style to me at the core. There are other interesting elements I consider to be significant improvements over the Quest for Glory titles, such as NPC scheduling. As you play the game, you may notice some NPCs, even shopkeepers, meandering around town, heading to the tavern for a drink or other such activities. Shops are open during certain times of the day, and when they aren't open or sleeping, the shopkeeper is found elsewhere. 
This makes the game world feel much more lively, and I never found it a bother to track down a particular NPC I was after, and in fact, this aspect comes into play for more than one quest resolution. I'd love to go on about the game in more detail, but I'd hate to spoil anything for prospective players, and that's the sort of player for whom this video is made after all, those who have yet to play Heroine's Quest. If you have even a passing interest in the Quest for Glory, King's Quest, or point-and-click adventure genre in general, I strongly suggest checking out this absolutely free game for yourself and seeing what you think. It's also available on Steam for ease of access, and if you absolutely love it, I would further suggest the Developer Appreciation Package, which is $2.99 and a way of saying thank you for producing such an incredible game. If you do decide to purchase this Appreciation Pack, various extras are provided. The game was originally planned to have some CGI cutscenes, and one of those is included, as well as an entire PDF that acts as a sort of a review of progress from one of the developers. Finally, there's an alpha build of the game that becomes playable. If you take the time to play the alpha, the amount of polish in the final product becomes even more clear. As far as I'm concerned, no game has ever captured the spirit of the Quest for Glory games as closely as Heroine's Quest manages to do so well. I'd highly recommend this game to all point-and-click adventure lovers. This game is truly an authentic love letter to the Quest for Glory series, and the execution is better than I could have asked for. Heroine's Quest won the Best Game in 2013 AGS Awards, which is the Adventure Game Studios' official awards ceremony, winning 13 total that year, and I believe it deserved every single one of them. Regretfully, there does not appear to be a sequel for this title on the horizon, but I have stumbled across another interesting project called The Serpents of Seraph, in development by a group called Bronze Crow Studios. There is very little information about this game in the wild, but if Heroine's Quest is the equivalent of Quest for Glory 1, Serpents of Seraph appears to be heavily inspired by Quest for Glory 2, Trial by Fire, and looks incredible from what little data is available, so I'll be watching this one as closely as I can with high hopes. If you've made it to this point in the video, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to my rambling about this wonderful game. I'd be greatly appreciative if you'd subscribe, like, or comment. If you have played this game, feel free to gush about it, or Quest for Glory, in the comments section. I won't be upset. Until next time, happy adventuring.